Hi, I'm MK Anderson, and I'm here with Matthew Dawkins, creative strategist for Onyx Path Publishing. He's a writer and developer on several game lines, including the upcoming World Below, a subterranean dark fantasy RPG. The backer kit crowdfunding for the game is linked below. Hi, Matthew. Hello, MK. It's lovely to be back. Uh, when was the last time we did this? I mean, on as in a recorded <laughs> conversation. Uh, about 14 months ago. 14 months. Good Lord. Yeah. Oh. Well, things have changed a lot in that time, haven't they? they they've changed a little bit. <laughs> uh, I guess we work together, uh, yeah. we game together a little bit. So, uh, pitch me the world below a little bit. Oh, you want me to pitch you? Okay, all right. Get, yes. get, your, your, get your wallet ready, get your Bitcoin ready to, <laughs> uh, or whatever it is you do with Bitcoin. Um, see it burn, I guess. The World Below is a game of subterranean fantasy in which your characters are the descendants of survivors of a great exodus from the surface world that has experienced some unknown cataclysm to your people. You exist in a world that is largely hostile to your existence and are trying to explore it, build your settlements to ensure your safety and the safety of the people you care about, as well as providing for your lineage, your families, your friends to come. It is a game that sort of combines the lethality, uh, the terror, if you like, of a lot of traditional fantasy games with some wonder and discovery and construction, so it's not all hopelessly bleak. Uh, it is a game that has a strong political element, from my perspective, and a certain uh, philosophical one, too when it comes to matters of, well, how does one survive in a hostile environment? How does one survive when there are limited resources uh, to spread between the people that are existing within you? How does one survive when one is in a permanent refugee state? And uh, is there the ability to improve the lot, not just of your own people, but of everyone around you? And these are questions that I've often examined in, in the games I've written, but this one is the most explicitly that way. It's certainly a venue you can explore when uh, playing or running the world below. So yeah, that's my pitch. I think we've reached the... That, that was a long pitch, so we've reached the 48th floor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I did want to talk about uh, two of those political themes. Okay. Uh, first... You, you tackle uh, refugees. Uh, mm. As you said, there's some kind of cataclysm in the world above that drove non-native peoples below. Yes. And then secondarily, the, the closer you get to the bottom, the closer you get to the well, there are well liches who control uh, essentially the source of power mm. in the world below. Uh why these themes? <laughs> well, uh, I mentioned in our last chat, one of my biggest literary inspirations is J.G. Ballard. I have a strong attraction to vertically inclined horror, uh, but it also makes for a wonderful metaphor, a rather blatant one, admittedly, uh, for trickle-down, or trickle-up in this case, economics, and uh, the way people on levels farthest away from the uh, the bank often suffer. In the world below, the power, as you say, exists in the form of the well. Uh, the well, in, in its fantasy mold, is a source of chaotic, magical energy. And anyone has access to it wherever you are, but you're more likely to suffer deleterious effects through using it the further away you are. The ease of access to it will struggle. The closer you are to the surface, where things are more toxic and where people are constantly struggling uh, with the ability to exist, quite frankly. And I think it's something that rarely gets explored beyond face value in a lot of role-playing games, especially fantasy RPGs. We often play fantasy RPGs that have a feudal-esque society, and feudal's probably the wrong word. Uh, it's, I guess, a pseudo-medieval or Middle Ages even uh, fantasy world for a lot of the games we play. 
And I can absolutely understand why most people aren't interested in playing uh, economics or medieval economics, the role playing game. Uh, but okay. for me, sometimes that can be a really interesting thing. It can create moral quandaries, interesting religious dichotomies, uh, reasons for societies to cooperate or fall apart. And so that layered on top of, as you as you mentioned, the refugee status of the vast majority of the people you will be playing as in this game means there's a lot of struggles to, I guess, find your place and find a direction that you want to head in to improve the lot of yourself, first and foremost, and then your family and your friends and your settlement and, latterly, everyone around you, if they will accept the help that you are providing in the form in which you're providing it. Um, the, the refugee element is something I'm very sensitive about uh we we've tried not to be too heavy-handed with it and you know topically uh given the time at which we're recording uh there's uh, there's all kinds of new reasons to discuss it uh, but my thinking was this when conceptualizing the game that while there may well be people who pre-existingly live in the world below and some of them may well be hostile to your, well, to the ancestors of your characters, the people who first descended because of the great cataclysm on the surface. Your characters and their ancestors didn't have a choice. This wasn't a question of simply grabbing land because they wanted somewhere better to live. This wasn't a colonialization incident where a more, let's say, Christianized society turned up on the shores of a non-Christian society and said, right, well, we're claiming this and calling this the Holy Land or, or something like that. This was a case where if they did not descend, they would have been annihilated. And so the reaction of the people who already lived in the world below was sometimes hostile. You're, we're going to lose all of our our safe safety, our habitats, our resources, but was in the most cases uh, charitable. It was open. It was, well, we can see that these people are on the precipice of being wiped out. But that's just the inciting moment. That's the point where the refugees arrived and they trickle in over the course of probably days, weeks, and then months, maybe even years before the cataclysm breaches its pinnacle. We don't know the nature of the cataclysm. It's largely irrelevant. And we are, as mentioned, several ge generations on. At that point, what is the situation of the refugees and their descendants? What's the situation of the people who lived here before? What's the relationship between them? Is there quite happy cooperation, coexistence, everyone supporting each other, where if resources were scarce before they arrived, how are people coping with that now? Uh, is there a desire to reclaim or stake claims? Is there now a state of exceptionalism where some of the people who descended came with the idea that, yes, we're desperate, We thank you, thank you, thank you, three generations on, we're survivors, all I've known is this cave, is just as much mine as it is yours. It's... It's one of those questions that has no easy answer, and it's not supposed to. You know, we're not trying to purport that in this fantasy realm, one side is right and one side is wrong. The reason that clash exists and those questions exist is so that you can play with them in game, hopefully with maturity and explore some themes that you wouldn't ordinarily get to do in a fantasy game. You did such a cool thoughtful thing of when you um i think in a lot of fantasy games like especially D, &D carries the baggage of races and mm. i appreciate that you <laughs> shifted that over to dawn like just the place you came from like what culture yeah. did you come from to some extent your lineage but but not that's one part of it how did you decide to go that direction instead of a more traditional one, let's say? <laughs> well, yeah, that's a really good question. I've not been asked that much, to be honest. And that's because I think in the last few years there has been something of a sea change in RPGs. You are quite correct. 
for the longest time it was always my race is elf or my race is half orc therefore i have bonuses to strength and negatives to charisma as if to imply that those kinds of traits are genetic yeah and the the thing is at face value if you are just playing numbers on a sheet and you don't give this more than a surface read you can enjoy playing a game like that just as well as you can enjoy a cop show. You know, it's uh, just because you're enjoying something with what may be considered a problematic element doesn't mean you're endorsing it, doesn't mean you believe in eugenics (laughs) or copaganda (laughs) or anything like that. But, yeah, you can play that. Um, But I felt like there was no reason for us to have that in the world below. We have moved on. There are games that have explored these things in much more nuanced ways than those original plus two strength, minus two charisma, or you know, worse, a minus two intelligence, implying a race is somehow less intelligent. Um, the What we wanted to do uh, was, as you say, we've got our Dawn, which uh, it summarizes, as you say, where you're from, more or less the people that raised you or their culture, uh, your belief system, and your employment via a guild. So this is very much your your meat and potatoes background. This is what you're doing when you're not out adventuring, exploring, slaying monsters, finding hidden cities and lost treasures, and so on and so forth. And the core part of that that I think is in question is what we call ancestry and what other games may call race. Some call them people, some call them heritage. There's lots of different words for the same thing, and landing on the right one is tricky, but I think most people will agree now race is not the right one to use. And we use ancestry not to describe who your character is biologically, although you certainly can share the same biological ancestry as your parents uh, or even the community in which you've been raised, but it is to say the way the, the cultural traditions that have been passed down to you from father to son or mother to daughter or whatever the case may have been. Uh, so I think some of the, at least one of the ready-made characters in the book is, I think, unless this has been changed, uh, maybe a, a an, an elf that was raised by Antissia. That's like a serpent kind of people, broadly speaking. Uh, but or it could be the other way around. But my my thinking again is that it who your parents are. It's a nature versus nurture question, isn't it? It's. Uh, just because your parents may have been serial killers doesn't mean you are going to grow up to be a serial killer. Or just because your parents were scientists doesn't mean you're going to grow up to be a scientist. And yeah, uh, we just wanted to make it more about, I think, nurture, culture, your outlook on life. And so ancestry doesn't affect your attributes. It doesn't affect your skills. It affects your how you generate momentum which is a way of essentially, mechanically speaking, getting re-rolls. But that's because what you're doing is tapping into the things you learned when you were young to sort of give you an extra bit of pep. You're fighting for your family or you're remembering those wise words your Uncle Ben told you as he got killed, you know? Uh, that That's ancestry, not... Uh, yeah... My, my parents were like this, therefore I am a perfect uh, genetic mix of both. I guess you do want to ask, like, there is sort of a generational play here. Like, yeah. You can play as as the kids of the adventures you used to play. Mm-hmm. And how did you come up? <laughs> why, uh, why do that? Uh, well, partly for the reasons we've just discussed. I, I'm a big fan of the Pendragon RPG, right. uh, which is an Arthurian knights RPG, starts in the reign of King Uther, ends at the end of Arthur's reign, although different editions have extended or contracted that. 
and the idea of that game is you play about three generations of knights and it's usually and you start building your family in the first adventure and by the end of it you're playing the i guess ultimate descendant of that and in that game which is a little more raw shall we say you are inheriting a lot of your father's or your mother's traits now I like the idea of generational play because it gives the world a sense of scale and it gives your character's actions a sense of scale, almost an inverse, to be honest, uh, when compared to the world. The world is expanding, it is contracting, it is ever-changing. Chaos throughout it means maps ultimately become useless uh, and so explorers constantly have to go out and uh, make new maps and cartographers guild is flourishing and so on and so forth your character's impact on the world is as meaningful or not as the actions you perform in game but the idea of generational play is on one hand, you get to further your ancestors' actions. Maybe they left a task incomplete. Maybe they set down an agenda and you feel the need to follow in its footsteps. Or maybe you want to do the exact opposite of that. And it comes back, as I mentioned, that, that question of ancestry and are we destined to follow in our parents' footsteps? Are we given this ancestral mandate and when I look at it from a player's perspective, I think no. And the reason I think no is because players very rarely play exact clones of the previous character. If we look at a game like Crusader Kings 2 or Crusader Kings 3, a game we've played before, um, it's very rare and it would be very unsatisfying if every successive prince was exactly the same as the prior one. So what yeah. you get to do is explore the same world in the world below as your ancestor, but you get to approach it in a different way with the foreknowledge of what your ancestor presumably learned and passed down to you when you were an infant or left written on tablets and so on. So you can go in with a greater sense of knowledge, but less ability and a different motivation. And that results in really interesting stories in my experience, just the same as I'm a big fan, I'm no monarchist, but I'm a big fan of reading about the kings and queens of England and some of the most interesting parts are the kinds of things that got adapted into A Song of Ice and Fire when um, this lord has three sons, is investing everything in the eldest son, and then the eldest son dies of dysentery on campaign in, in France. And so now we're left with Richard II, uh, his grandson, because his other son um, has been not knocked out of primogeniture. So it goes to Richard, who likes to just sit on a throne and look pretty and doesn't know how to rule the country. But it's a lot more interesting than if John of Gaunt had become king, who was a lot more competent and probably would have just kept things going on in the same way, you know? Um, so, yeah. Uh, you know, you know me, MK. I never have a simple answer to any question. That's okay. Could have just said yes. I find it really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's. I mean, I have made sure to shorten my question worth this time. So it's. <laughs> I had like twelve <laughs> questions last time, and it's like, and we're going to go through all of them. So I, I shortened them a little bit this time. I, I, I don't often go back and watch interviews that I've done before or anything like that. Um, I, I'm much like anyone, well, pretty much everyone, no one likes to listen to themselves on tape. No one likes to watch themselves perform. And I didn't know until, I guess, a few months ago that you had basically fast-forwarded <laughs> our entire <laughs> discussion <laughs> of the Russian Revolution. I remember you saying that you had edited it and then I saw you had literally sort of gone <laughs> for what was probably about eight minutes of chat got condensed to 20 seconds of gesticulation. Well, I, 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 okay, so it was because we were talking about Russia and because I did, yes. it, I was completely certain that you were correct in what you were saying, but I didn't want a bunch of people who have a lot of opinion on Russia and the Russian Revolution mm. to land in my mentions, in my in my comments, 
and tell me what dipshit I am. (laughs) Well, I mean, if all you Russian Revolution fanatics are watching right now, I'm saying hello. I'm always happy to talk about the 1905 to 1921 period. (laughs) Uh, But, uh, yeah, we will try not to go down uh, that path. Not, not, not quite yet. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so, speaking of politics, you have got a transition. <laughs> this. Th- oh yes, well, well done. You knew this would happen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm prepared. Um, yes. This book is very intentionally political. Um, why have you chosen to mm-hmm. dive into games when there is like? sort of a wider, I guess, crappy gamer question of should you be political at all? <laughs> I, well, you're right. It is a crappy gamer question. <laughs> <laughs> not, not Your question isn't crappy. The idea of should you be political, uh, I, like, I, I get it. I do understand why people say, look, I work, I, I live my life. Games, games are a retreat for me. I want to get away from from the real world. I understand that. I feel the same. Um, however, I also feel like exploring politics in a fantasy world is actually quite interesting. And uh, ju- you know, I find history and politics uh, very interesting in the real world too. But putting making it, I guess, an overt part of the world below isn't something I would do with every game. And isn't something I've I've worked on a lot of games, many of which have haven't really touched upon um, material like this. Although that said, I think I probably put something Russian revolutionary in pretty much everything <laughs> over the last five years. Whoops. Uh, uh, but no, um, I just I just felt it, that it was a natural part of a game like this that it would be more unnatural if every single settlement in the world below, for instance, had a had a king seize power, uh, who rules with an absolute monarchy, and everyone is perfectly fine with that existence. I mean, we don't know much about the society these people descended from, or societies, because these people descended from all over the place to enter the world below. But it's very unlikely that every single one of those was from an absolute monarchy. And wouldn't you know it, they're all happy to stick a crown on someone's head and say, what would you like from us now, dear leader? That isn't what I wanted for the world below. I don't think it would have been terribly interesting. And so, yeah, the very simplistic side of things is that, yeah, different settlements have different uh, modes of government. We have uh, there's a guild council running a sort of syndicalist uh, settlement. You've got a monarchy, almost an emperor, or at least he calls him one, in another settlement. Uh, You kind of run the gamut of what might be considered a realistic form of government within the fantasy constraints we're putting down. Uh, but that's all to make things interesting, uh, not just to me as the writer, but or one of the writers, uh, but to to the readers too. It's one of the big issues I've I always had when working on Vampire the Masquerade was, uh, and I there's a lot of projects I worked on for Vampire that I loved. Do not do not get me wrong, and I worked on it for a very long time. But I always found it quite frustrating that so many people defaulted to the Chicago by night, one prince, one primogen for every single clan, which actually wasn't the case in Chicago by night, but that's how everyone treated it. A sheriff, a seneschal, and basically someone to fill every single slot on the map, as it were. And then everyone else is just peasants. I thought, especially in America... Uh, which has historically been fairly anti-monarchy. Well, I say that. They've been fairly anti-British monarchy, uh, but sometimes crawl back. It's, you know, you do love... You You Americans do love your lineages, uh, not not including you, MK. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> the royal you. Of course. <laughs> Dynasties, I should say. Yeah. Um, 
but the yeah the idea that every single Camarilla city needed a prince every single Camarilla city was going to really acknowledge every single clan with a primogen it just got dull so and that and that was never the intention with vampire that's just the way people interpreted it and so with v5 when i worked on that i made sure every single domain i presented had a different governmental setup sometimes it was very subtle we didn't highlight it it was just there but every single one was set up differently because i thought yeah if i'm an american vampire and i take down the prince or there is no prince in the city maybe in fact i'm part of the city that was only properly founded in the late 19th century why on earth would i a 20 to 50 year old vampire call myself prince i'm far more likely to say i'm the governor or more likely to say i or, or have a bunch of lackeys or stooges or whatever call me senator or something like that and yeah there may still be autocracy power through yeah. blood <laughs> but it is but yeah that ultimately becomes a lot more interesting to me and so you see that kind of thing in the world below as well so I'm currently editing the world yes. below and it's got this <laughs> I and I edited the Ashcan edition which I'll, I'll link below and it's got this cool, lush, like almost literary voice for, for a lot of it. But then it's written from multiple points of mm. view. Uh, so you do a lot of different voices within it. Um, and they disagree about core facts about the world. Yeah. Um, I, I would say that one of your interests as a writer, just having read a lot of your writing at this point, is voice, is multiple city of voices is having different voices disagreeing on different things um and like i even within game lines like they came from beyond the grave does not sound like they came from beneath the sea and those are the same game line yeah uh is that something you have like intentionally tried to develop through your work or is it just a preoccupation or what that is another uh, if you don't mind my saying so that is another excellent question I don't think I I consider that at least not consciously I think I probably put myself through something of a trial by fire on that when I worked on a book called Becker's Jihad Diary for Vampire again where I was one of the developers, myself and a um, man by the name of Neil Raymond Price, a very talented developer. We both uh, worked on this book with a great crew of writers. But the whole point of that book was to present loads of transcripts, diary entries, interviews, blog posts, you know, assorted print media to go into this diary, this journal, uh, where a vampire was traveling around the world interacting with different vampires. And part of my job as developer was to ensure all of the uh, voices sounded different. But what also happened, as often happens in big collaborative projects, is some writers dropped assignments. Some writers couldn't hit deadlines, or their work wasn't up to snuff, or they just had to walk away for whatever reason. That's perfectly fine. That happens. And so as developer or co-developer, uh, I had to pick up some of those chapters and write them. And sometimes that meant I had to make that work conform to voices that had appeared elsewhere in the book. Sometimes I had to create whole new voices. Uh, but I was very hands-on, knee-deep, if you like, in that book. Probably more so than any other book I've worked on, despite the fact I co-developed it. I was... I finely tuned that book to a, a, a remarkable degree and i that's not me trying to claim its quality that's for readers to decide but i know that for instance i was so hard on myself in terms of work just something as simple as word count that i knew every single chapter could not come in more than this even though in reality i knew word count was more flexible than that and so i was trying to make all these statements and voices sound distinctive within that framework and by doing that 
on this book that contains probably somewhere like 200 voices, maybe more. Not all of them are mine. But by doing that, that really acted as a positive experience for me as an author because it it gave me certain skills, allowed me to practice certain skills through writing and passing it by Neil, who got to review my work. I needed him to. You know, a lot of my work was rough, as it often is when a writer tries to develop their own work. And through that process, I was able to come at things like The World Below much later and very confidently say, this person from Oriasis sounds different to this person from Telva's Half, and this is why. It's partly you know, going to be the culture, it's going to be their upbringing, to go back to things like ancestry, it's going to be their attitude toward the person they're speaking with and the subject they're speaking on. All these questions... I, I kind of ask myself very much subconsciously while I'm writing. I'm not, I don't uh, make any kind of list, but I know that these things are things I consider while I'm writing it. And they came from is the same. It's a, it's a different kind of challenge because whereas in the world below and something like Beckett's Jihad Diary and the apocalyptic record for Werewolf, what we're aiming for is multiple voices often arguing over a core point, like you uh, just illustrated. In something like They Came From Beneath the Sea or They Came From Beyond the Grave, what we're aiming for is a definitive tone. Uh, this, uh, this needs to be a consistent tone throughout the book, because if that tone drops, the reader is going to no longer feel attached to the material. Uh, the material needs to have a strong authorial voice. And if it doesn't, it will read like any other textbook. And that is absolutely not the point with something like they came from. Uh, they all need, beneath the sea needs to sound overwrought and hammy and well, more overwrought <laughs> than anything else. Beyond the Grave is, <laughs> is definitely hammy, a little gothic, maybe seductive. Um, they came it's, from... it's Vincent Price. Yeah, yeah. There's a, yeah, there's a vi... sort of like... yes. There is a Vincent Price narrator <laughs> to Beyond the Grave. Uh, Camp. They came from Camp Murder Lake. Is quite leery and prurient, and a lot of the, some of this comes through from the writers because I always try to hire the best possible writers I can for these things. But I know that as the developer of these books, co-developer on. They came from the Cyclops' Cave uh, with Michele Masala. That the buck stops with me or us. And when it stops at the developer, that means I need to look at the work again. And I need to read it from beginning to end. And I need to feel like all of that sounds like it's by the same person. I don't want to lose flavor. I don't want writers to look at their work and think, this doesn't feel like what I wrote. Uh, because I'd hate that. I, I do hate that if I turn something in and it comes back utterly bleached. Uh, but as a developer, I do. Ne I need to refine it, I suppose, more than dampen it. I need to, you know, draw out the spikes, make it a little more arch if it's something like Beyond the Grave, rather than, yeah, trying to just hammer it into a consistent paste. <laughs> Uh, which some RPGs definitely read like that, and it's not just RPGs. Sometimes, I'm sure you know, uh, there are plenty of editors who really, who are excellent editors, fantastic, really yes. thorough, but by the time they're done, they've bled the work white. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, in it. You, you have to do, you have to be so careful not to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, hopefully, hopefully I don't do that. I try not. To. No, I think but your editing is. Uh, I don't mind saying it on this recorded call, MK. I think your editing is absolutely superb. I have. Uh, I've Thank you. been uh, the very lucky recipient of your edits now on more than one project, and uh, yeah, what I think is most striking about it. This sounds like a personal development plan now. Uh, we're here for your one-to-one -one review, MK. Uh, what, <laughs> what, 
what I think is most striking about your editing is it doesn't feel like edits. It feels like guidance and advice, and I can see the reason behind it. Now, I admit, uh, as a creative, I'm... And this isn't a boast, this is just how I am, I think. I am somewhat thick-skinned, if that's the right term, when it comes to critique. Uh, I'm more than happy to read complaints, and I'll try and take the best from them. And so, yeah, if I get a particularly heavy edit, I will... Oh, I take a while, but I will look at it to see, okay, so what can I take from this? But I've never read your work on my work and thought, good God, what a what a twat. <laughs> 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 Send it to a new editor. My ego can't take we're it. Supposed to... <laughs> we're supposed to be on the same side. It's supposed to be a collaboration, yeah. personally, yeah. I think. And 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 I, I I do think that a very good grasp of, of grammar is just another tool in the box, another way to say something a little more precisely or, you know, stuff like that. So it's like, ideally, I can be an educational resource. I know it sounds patronizing to say I educate a man who's about my age, but... No, you, but, know, you could be educating you know, someone twice your age. It's... I know as a writer, my biggest fault is I struggle to lose voice. I think I would really find it very difficult to uh, write something that was deliberately without tone, just to be informative, a textbook, for instance. Uh, I think uh, the, the good news is, not that I'm likely to, but if I ever wanted to get into history writing the swell of narrative histories these days it is booming for a long time in the 20th century the idea of doing stories in history you know telling the story of the revolution or this king or that was certainly not in vogue but now the authorial voice is seems to be coming back so who knows uh, there may be hope for me outside of this field one day <laughs> I uh, my agent represents those, so yeah, they um we talked before about about how he handles uh historical nonfiction and and he says actually one of the weaknesses of people who want to do this kind of fiction or nonfiction is they often don't have a voice. Yeah, they're often very academic and they've had the voice trained out of them. Mm. And when it comes to commercial fiction, you have to be a storyteller. You have yeah. to be engaging. Like he thought gold standard for at least voice was, was China Miedo's October. He thought that was really excellently written in terms of just making sure there was a story there. To go back to the Russian Revolution for a moment, uh, <laughs> you, you know I'm a big fan of Stephen Kotkin's writing. I'm also a big fan of Anthony Beaver's writing. Uh, he... He's written a lot of 20th century history and always brings an accessibility to it and a certain excitement to it, which I really appreciate. You can often tell if an author is excited about their work. Sometimes the problem is an author may be excited about their work, but because they went to university and because they had to write a dissertation which had to be utterly lacking in flavour, you're right, it gets sort of beaten out of them or drilled into them. No, this needs to be a, a document about facts. <laughs> this just needs to be an account. And if you start adding... It doesn't even have to be opinion, but if you start adding flavour into it, then you're starting to dilute that fact, that precious uh, dryness that history has thrived on for, for much of the last hundred years. But yeah, uh, I don't think it has to be that way, certainly. I guess just as a final thing, uh, Matthew does have a Discord and runs games there. And um, in the past year or so, it's been a place where I've felt pretty free to be the most gentle, creative version of myself. And you recommended me for this role at Onyx Path. And, you know, I, I can confidently say my life would not be 
uh, the same without you in it. Wow. So, thank you. I am so glad to have met you. And what's more, from our very first chat, the fact that we have not only stayed in contact, but our relationship has got closer. Uh, the yes, you are not only uh, a you're not just a paying customer, <laughs> uh, and you know the uh, if if people are particularly interested, because I know a lot of your viewers are very politically active or politically interested. We do have a political sub channel on my Discord now, and the reason we do. is because of MK. Utter, it's not just me. I think what, it's not just what me. We would call can, can I name other people in here? Probably not. Can I name other not, people not in here? Not without their consent. It's fall. Whoever, whoever <laughs> is okay, part, no, okay. I don't know. <laughs> well, I guess I'll wrap this up. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you so much for having me. And yeah, people, back the world below, please, on Backer Kit. Yes down in the yeah, description. Support your local creators.